Welcome to Unlocking the Dream Vision. I am your host, author R.J. Von Bruning. This video series will be exploring the mysterious dream vision of Enoch as explored in my book, Unlocking the Dream Vision, The Secret History of Creation. In this video will take a look at the rest of the story. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to hit the like button below and subscribe for future videos. This series presents information based in part upon theory and conjecture of the system of esoteric symbolism. The purpose is to suggest some possible interpretation, but not necessarily the only one to the many mysteries we will explore. We have now reached a point where we begin leaving the mystical symbolism of the dream vision and the esoteric knowledge that it holds behind and begin entering into the world of modern knowledge. Unlike the mystical symbolism we've been exploring, much of what will follow here is rather straightforward. It also becomes easy to understand with our new knowledge of the esoteric symbolism and the secret history of creation that is told through the animal symbolism of the dream vision. This leg of the journey begins after the destruction of the heaven and the events leading up to the great and final battle, the judgment, and the great transformation of the sheep. It is at this point that the younger Dryas begins to unleash its unrelenting cold, ice, and drought upon the world for approximately 1,300 years. This was the beginning of a dark and troubled time of death that brought extinction to at least 40 different large prehistoric animals and dozens of different plant species. As we have learned, the remnant that was saved and the survivors of the final battle with the help of the gods go underground to live while they wait out the climatic changes in the many different underground cities and tunnel networks that have been found all around the world. One of the things that does not appear to enter anybody's mind would be the fact that there were many people in the world that were not involved in any of this, nor were they saved or killed by any of the terrible events that unfolded. These were the people who simply lived their lives far from all the dramatic events that occurred. For many of them, they were probably totally unaware that anything had happened until the weather began to change and all the animals and plants began to die off. As you can imagine, for these people, after the fighting was over and the gods had saved the remnant and gone away, society as a whole would just basically start to collapse or slow down across the board as the population slowly collapsed. Given the additional factor that the support and guidance of the gods had also vanished, the entire support network and the primary reason and purpose for this civilization to even exist had also disappeared. Outside of a small handful of cities and a few outposts scattered here and there, it appears that the rest of humanity had entered into a great dark age with most of all the surviving people returning to a much more primitive form of existence or basically a Neolithic like form of society whereby very little if anything was remembered as the needs of day-to-day -day survival became the single most important thing in these people's lives. After roughly a thousand years of cold and ice starting at approximately 9500 BC the Younger Dryas begins to come to an end. The ice stops advancing, the rains begin returning, and the climate in general begins to stabilize and start to warm up. It is soon after this time that we see the mysterious ancient site in southwest Turkey known as Gopeki Tepe. For those who are not familiar with this site, it is an archaeological site in southeastern Turkey. The site includes what is believed to be two different phases of work. The first is where circles of massive T-shaped pillars were erected. There are more than 200 known pillars in 20 different stone circles that are currently known through the geophysical surveys in the area. Typically each pillar has a height of about 6 meters or 20 feet and they each weigh an estimated 20 tons. They are then fitted into sockets that were hewn directly out of the bedrock. The second phase of building, the pillars are normally smaller in size and stood in rectangular rooms with floors of polished lime. All the pillars contain numerous animal symbolism carved into them. 
One of the biggest mysteries about this site is the fact that at around 9000 BC, the entire site appears to have been purposely buried by the inhabitants and then abandoned where it sat forgotten for almost 11,000 years until its re rediscovery in the late 20th century. The secret that is needed to understand this mysterious ancient archaeological site is recognizing the huge amount of animal symbolism on the stone pillars. This animal symbolism is exactly the same type of animal symbolism that we've been exploring through the dream vision and the ancient artifacts. Once we begin to realize this connection of the mystical animal symbolism, we can begin to piece together this story. We can now easily imagine that after the ice had stopped advancing and the climate had stabilized and began warming up, the Lord God faction began trying to reestablish a new society at this site, with the first modern humans created by the Great Transformation. I suspect that once all the pillars are uncovered at this site, we will have a complete version of, of the symbolic dream vision as told through the mystical animal symbolism. I also suspect that we'll find that the site is set up very similar to like a modern day Christian church, where the layout of the church and its symbolism within it reflect the 12 stations of the cross and the overall passion story of Christ as told in the Bible. This allows us to understand that this entire site is most likely set up in this type of way and that through a process, through an unknown ritual and ceremony, you would be told the hidden meaning and story of all the animals and the symbolism on the pillars. This would be very similar and likely to be a complete version of the secret history of creation that we've been exploring. This then allows us to realize that it appears that the Lord God faction was trying to reestablish their earlier slave society from before in the hope that our ancestors would view and worship them as gods as they once had before. Based on what we now know, I think it's more likely to think that they were very unsuccessful and after a few hundred years, they buried and abandoned the site. Very shortly, we'll take a closer look at, the pos at this possible aspect, but we must first look at a m more likely reason on why they would have abandoned the site and the vast ice sheet once the vast ice sheets began to melt. According to modern science, it appears that this site was buried and then abandoned at roughly the same time that the great ice sheets, had, which had been growing during the Younger Dryas, began to melt. As you are most likely already aware, the melting of the great ice sheets of the last ice age and the Younger Dryas had a huge impact on the entire world, with one of the most dramatic and visible being that the water level of the oceans was raised by an estimated 400 feet to the present levels of today. This massive rise in sea level also drastically changed the climate the world over, creating the world as we more or less know it today. Additionally, as the great ice sheets melted, it radically changed the weather patterns for the entire world. This began the long, slow process of turning once lush, wet, and green areas into vast deserts, while at the same time turning once hot deserts into lush areas of forest with large amounts of animal life. And in still in other areas, the great deserts disappeared and became great grasslands and plains, while other areas became jungles. What is important to understand about this massive climate change from the ice melting and the even more radical change of the ocean levels that it basically cut them off from the rest of the world. If this interpretation that we've been exploring is correct and the New Jerusalem is located on the Antarctic landmass, then we can easily imagine that the gods would have had more pressing problems than trying to reestablish their old way of life. With the most important being the fact that while all around the world the ice was melting, the opposite happened in Antarctica. The ice began to advance. This was because the warm ocean currents that once brought heat to Antarctica radically changed their course as massive amounts of fresh water were injected into the oceans from the melting ice. This massive influx of fresh water shifted the ocean currents from the south to the north into the patterns we now know today. This change in the ocean currents had the effect of turning Antarctica into a frozen wasteland it is today. Realizing this, common sense tells us that the gods would have either had to abandon the site or they would have had to move it underground as the ice advanced. If we take our new knowledge of the secret esoteric history of creation and combine it with all the odd reports over the years about strange and mysterious things happening at the bottom of the world, 
we can reasonably think and suspect that the Lord God faction had no choice but to move underground to avoid the advancing ice. Given the size of the New Jerusalem as it's described in the Bible, it is easy to understand that moving such a large complex underground would be a daunting and time-consuming task to accomplish. In addition, as the sea levels began to rise, this New Jerusalem, if it was located in a relatively low spot, then flooding would also become a major concern, causing additional engineering problems. These practical problems combined with the incredible climate change going on at the time would have just basically cut them off from the rest of the world. In addition, we have a large body of ancient myth, legend, and folklore of when and how the many different peoples of the world slowly began re-emerging from living underground for hundreds of years after the fiery destruction of the heaven and the coming of the ice. The more familiar and famous of these ancient stories come from the many native tribes of the Americas, with the Hopi tribe of northern Arizona having one of the most popular and widely known versions of this type, this type of story. As many are already aware, within the Hopi story, it is said that after the destruction of the last world, the Hopi people lived underground for an unknown amount of time in an area in or around the Grand Canyon in northern Arizona. With the aid of numerous servants of the gods. These servants of the gods are typically described as an insect like humanoid, which are commonly referred to as the ant people. Many have already remarked that this traditional description of the ant people are very similar to the modern day descriptions of what is popularly known as the greys within UFO lore. With the common idea that these alien creatures have a very thinly built body with large heads with big black almond shaped eyes with gray skin. It is easy to imagine how somebody would think the typical gray alien of today in modern pop culture and UFO lore would, could easily be thought of as some type of insect like people. In a future video we will explore who these ant people the Hopi may have truly been. The Hopi story then goes on to say that after a long period of time of living underground with the servants of the gods, many of the people started to become restless and long to return to the surface. In the few known versions of this story, it is at this point that some type of conflict begins among the people. This conflict develops when the people break into two groups, with one group wishing to leave, while the other wishing to stay with the servants of the gods. It is at this point that the servants of the gods intervene and allow the ones who wish to leave to leave and return to the surface of the world. It is these people that left the safety of the underground shelter that the Hopi say their own people and tribe are descended from. The story of the Hopi is very similar to others found around the world, and in all of them, at some unknown point in time after the ice had melted and the stars had moved, the many different peoples of the world began to leave the safety of these underground shelters and return to the surface and restart again. Within a vast number of these different ancient myths from all over the world, we are told that soon after leaving the underground shelters, and there was the coming of a great godlike bearded white man who arrived from the sea during this time of troubles. Some of the best known stories of this mysterious individual comes from the Mesoamerican cultures that were recorded by the Spanish conquistadors in the 16th century. The best known of these ancient myths about this mysterious bearded individual is the Inca creator and civilizing deity known as Veneroco. Although the Inca legend called him Veneroco, this mysterious individual was known by many other tribes and went by many other names. What's truly remarkable is that all the myths and cultures of Mesoamerica, the Veneroco is always remembered and described the same way. He is normally remembered as the creator of all things, but not in the sense that he created the world like a monothistic idea. In the Mesoamerican traditions, he is the bringer of civilization, which was the substance and purpose for which all things were created. He is also intimately associated with the seas, the sun, and the mighty storm. Symbolically, he is commonly shown as wearing the sun for a crown with twin thunderbolts in his hands, with tears descending from his eyes representing the rains and the mighty waters. There's been much misunderstanding and mis 
misinterpretation of the accounts of Vinaroco and his physical appearance. This is most commonly due to the fact that many Christian sects tried to tie Vinaroco to their ideas of Jesus Christ or another Christian saint or prophet. Although many of these ideas are very creative, the truth is, is that the Spanish chronicles from the 16th century are the only source of information we have on this Venerocco. And the accounts by a Pedro de Lon and a Francis Pizarro, who helped conquer the Incas in 1532, they both describe how they and their other fellow conquistadors were greeted as gods and called Venerocos because of their light skin and their beards resembled their god Venerocco. In other similar accounts from the same time, we learn that Venerocco was remembered as a great bearded white man with striking blue eyes that had great godlike power and knowledge who came from the sea. In all the many different accounts recorded by the Spanish Chronicles, we are told the same basic story. This mysterious man appears sometime after the ice had melted and the oceans had risen, which would place his arrival sometime around 7,000 to possibly 8,000 BC at the earliest. He is commonly described as an older, gray-haired, bearded, grandfatherly-like man in a long flowing white cloak wearing sandals with striking crystal blue eyes and the power of a god and who came from the sea or on a great serpent. The many accounts liken his appearance to that of being an apostle of like Saint Bartholomew as painters have represented him over the years. In these accounts, we are told that after the Venerocco arrives, he finds the people living like animals with no trace of civilization being left. After arriving from the sea, he spends most of his time educating the people about civilization, bringing them farming, writing, building, and most importantly, how to properly worship the deity. What's truly remarkable about these accounts is the fact that Venerocco is not automatically viewed as a god by the people. He is instead normally viewed as just a great man who possessed great godlike powers and knowledge. What makes this so important is that it shows us that the great transformation not only physically changed us, but it also caused us to lose the unique trait that made our ancient ancestors think of them as gods or their technology as divine magic. Just as before, this appears to show us that the Lord God faction was trying to make an attempt to reestablish their way of life, but the grand transformation had been a little too successful. In all these accounts, we were told that after Venerocco had brought civilization to the people, he then left the same way he came, from the sea, on a great or in a great serpent. He was always remembered as saying when he left that he would one day return. But as far as anybody knows, he never has. With our new knowledge of the secret esoteric history of creation that we've unlocked with the mystical symbolism of the dream vision, we can begin to speculate and begin to understand that who this mysterious Venerocco had to have been. As you've already most likely guessed, it's highly probable that this Venerocco is in fact the leader of the Lord God faction going around the world trying to reestablish their power. The great serpent that he is typically described as having would of course been the legendary monster remembered in the biblical tradition as Leviathan and as we saw on Estella from an earlier video, which you can see here. Although our understanding of the secret history of creation can help us answer the question about who Venerocco possibly was, it cannot answer the many questions surrounding what exactly he was trying to do or why he left, seemingly never to return. But we can speculate that the grand transformation had worked far too well, and we just no longer viewed him or any of his associates as gods or as the messengers of gods like our, in the same way that our ancient cro manglin man ancestors had. After this mysterious Venerocco had left, the story seems to go silent for the next few thousand years, with appearing that there was no further contact between us and them. And if there was any contact, it has long been forgotten or was, wasn't recorded in the first place. 
Well, we do know that starting around 4,500 BC to approximately 4,000 BC, the climate began changing once again into the patterns we still see and experience today. One of the major effects of this climate change was the creation of the vast and empty wasteland known as the Sahara Desert from the once lush grasslands with ample water it once had been during the last ice age. This is an example of just one of the many major climate changes that occurred around this time. This climate change had the effect of forcing the people alive at the time to begin moving in great ebbs and flows across the land of the old world looking out for new sources of food and places to live. And this turmoil of racial comings and goings that both enriched and disrupted the entire area of the old world, these people began entering into the river valleys and began rediscovering the ruins of the ancient cities. This is one of the most important developments to happen since the great destruction hidden within the esoteric religious belief. Because as people began to re-enter the ancient abandoned cities, they began to rediscover this ancient knowledge we have today about the ancient world. But more importantly, they began claiming it for themselves. Why this great movement of people began to happen cannot be explained exactly, but the overwhelming presumption is, is that the root cause was not only climate change, but also possibly more important, that there was the beginnings of overpopulation in the lands these people came from. This appears to have forced people to start working together in defense for themselves and other groups searching and fighting for resources. The ones that found and occupied these ancient cities would have had a great military advantage over the ones who, who had not. As they searched these cities, they rediscovered the ancient world and began claiming it for themselves. It is also highly likely that there was even a possible remnants of Cro-Manglin men still surviving in and living among these great ancient cities. Once our ancestors began moving into the river valleys and the old cities, they either wiped out anybody living there or mated with them until they disappeared. It is also possible that due to the changes made to us during the Great Transformation that if we were to breed with Cro-Manglin man, the result would always be a Homo sapien sapien, or us thereby slowly breeding Cro-Manglin man completely out of existence. This is the most likely scenario that would have allowed our ancient ancestors to learn the secrets of the ancient world while also taking it all over at the same time. This allows us to realize and understand that the people who settled in the lands and islands of Greece and occupied the ancient Greek cities began identifying with the ancient Greeks. Over time, they not only began calling themselves Greek, but they also began claiming the ancient Greek history as their own. After just a f couple of generations, these people would have come to believe that they were the actual descendants of the ancient Greek people and culture. Whereas we now know that the dream vision, that this is not physically possible. Because the real ancient Greeks who built these cities and the culture that we call ancient Greece and were actually of our immediate ancestors of cro Manglin man and not us. This is the same basic situation all around the world, with some being more successful than others. Given what we know about this time historically, it appears that outside of reoccupying and claiming the ancient sites as their own, they did little else. They do not appear to have advanced much politically or culturally or economically. Once the people had reached basically the same level as, their ancient, as the ancient cultures that they were claiming as their own, they more or less just stopped in their development. What may be more important is that throughout this time, many of these people not only claimed the ancient cultures as their own, but they began copying the ancient texts and stories, or at least the ones they thought were important. But again, after they reached the same level as the ancients, they just stopped, and they appeared to have stayed at this level for the next few thousand years. In essence, they never actually created anything new. They appear to have just copied what they'd found. Now, this great dark age continues on for the next couple of thousand years. In our next video, we'll explore the rest of this great dark age that had fallen upon humanity. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button below and subscribe for future videos.